Good evening. Welcome to the online services for the Vernon Church of Christ. We're honored to have you with us this Wednesday evening, and hopefully something can be said to help us understanding God's will for us and help us to be more faithful in our walk with God. Last couple of weeks, we've been talking about the seven sayings that Christ spoke while he's on the cross, and we're on number six tonight. We covered the other five, and hopefully something could be said there that would benefit all of us. But we're going to be on the seventh or the sixth saying tonight, so get your Bibles out and turn to John chapter 19. It's there we'll be covering his sixth saying. And here we find it, John 19 and verse 30. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. Here we find the saying of Christ, probably the last saying he gave. We're going to look at the last saying of last next week. But some don't really know which one he said last, but it doesn't really matter. They both came right there at the end, around the three o'clock hour. But here Christ says, it is finished. We might say it is complete. But what he's telling us is he has completed everything that God has given for him to do in bringing about salvation for mankind. And for that, we are thankful. Because without Christ going to the cross and completing that plan, uh, we couldn't be saved. And hell will be our home one day. But we're thankful for what he did. And Jesus says here, everything has been completed. All the I's have been dotted. All the T's have been crossed. No loose ends. It's all finished. And that's what he brings out here in John 19 and verse 30, showing us it is complete. But one thing that we see about this in the completing of this process, it took submission. It took obedience from Christ to do this because it is something that, he knew he had to do, but as we'll see here in a moment, it's something that he didn't really want to do, at least go through the suffering that he went through. But let's look at his submission. In Hebrews chapter 5, verses 8 and 9, Though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. We see here that Christ learned obedience. One might say, well, what do you mean he learned obedience? I thought he was obedient all his life. He never sinned. He did everything the Father told him. Well, he learned obedience according to Hebrews 5 and verse 8. Some might want to think, well, that's when he was a little child. As learning or as a teenager, he was listening to his parents. That way he learned obedience. But that's not what the writer is speaking of. He learned obedience in a certain place in his life, in a certain location, as a matter of fact. And what we have to do is back up to verse 7 to find where he learned that obedience at. Look at Hebrews 5, 7 through 9. It says, Who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications, with vehement cries and tears to him, who was able to save him from death, and was heard because of his godly fear. Though he was a son, Yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. He, when did he learn obedience? We see in verse 7, it was in the Garden of Gethsemane. On that Thursday evening, when he goes there with his disciples, there he leaves three of them at a, at a stone's throw away. He then proceeds and begins to ask God something. He asked God, is there any other way? He asked God, if possible, take away this cup. You see, Christ was there, and he knew what he was soon have to go through, and he wasn't looking forward to it, not one bit. He knew the pain and the suffering that he was going to have to go through, and this, this is where he learned the obedience. He learned about this, how to be one that listened to God and followed God. He learned that there that very night. You see, on that night, Christ was there in the garden. He fell on his face. He prayed, the scriptures say. Of course, we understand that he prayed. He offered supplications to God. Well, that's not a word that we use every day. And this may be something that we don't hardly ever do. But supplication simply means to make the plea of an indigent, a beggar. So here's Christ. He is begging God. He is on the ground, his face on the ground. He has been praying, and now he is begging God if there be any other way. Let this cup pass from him. Of course, there was no other way. 
That was the only way in which mankind could be saved by Christ going through this. And also it says in verse 7 that he offered our vehement cries. I'm sure those disciples who were there a short distance away, they heard him crying. Vehement cries. They were very loud cries. He was crying out to God if there be any other way. You see, Christ, he didn't want to go through this suffering. But because he was going to be obedient to the Lord and go through and finish everything, he was willing to do that. It also says there in verse 7, he had tears. Now, these are not tears that would come on the outside of the eyes. Uh, in the scriptures, the New Testament, tears are mentioned seven times. Different words for each time that are mentioned. But here, it means the inside tears. The tears that one can cry, and yet no tears ever come forth. But inside, they're greatly emotional. Well, that's what is happening to Christ right here. He's there in the garden. He's down on his face. He is praying to God. He's offering supplications to God. Vehement cries are coming out. Tears on the inside. Lord, if there be any other way. And that's what he is asking. He is begging God at this time, if there be any other way. And of course, we know there simply was no other way. Jesus right here is literally, he is torn to pieces because of what he is going through. So when sometimes we may see some of these paintings that some artists may paint. I know I've seen a few of them before, and probably you have as well. They show Jesus in the garden, and there he's got his arms propped up on a rock. His hands are folded. He's looking up into the sky. Maybe the, the moon is shining on his face with no real concern, no real care or harm that's on his face. Well, that's not how the scriptures depicts that. It depicts Christ here on his face, praying, supplication, crying out tears. The artist's deception of this simply does not match what we find in the scriptures. But here's the Lord on that Thursday night, according to verse 7, in the Garden of Gethsemane, he learned obedience. He learned what it was, what it was like to go to God and do as God had given him to do and to carry out that plan of salvation by dying on the cross. So learning obedience is that which Christ did. And we find this also in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 8. Here it says, And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. So here's Christ. He became obedient even to the point of death. He was willing to give his life on the cross. And that's not a very good way to die. But yet he was willing to do that in order that mankind could be saved. So Philippians 2.8, again, shows his obedience. Another verse we need to look at is Hebrews 12 and verse 2. Here it says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Here the writer says, for the joy that was set before him. How could it be joy when yet he is in the garden praying to the Lord if there be any other way? If he is praying, how many supplications, vehement cries and tears, how could it be joy? Well, what Christ is doing here, Hebrews 2, 12, 12 and verse 2, he's looking at the end of the process, the joy of providing salvation. It wasn't going to be fun. It was going to be horrible. It's going to be torture, what he's going to go through, the suffering. But he looked at the end as to what it was going to accomplish. When he said it is finished, he knew he had accomplished everything the Lord had given him to do. You know, most people don't like going to the doctor. We go to the doctor because we're sick, but yet look at the end process. We look at getting well. We look at regaining our health. We look at the things that we were doing and, and getting those back in our life. Again, that's the joy set before us, not going to the doctor, but the outcome of what it's going to be. Well, that's what Christ did here. He looked at the outcome of his suffering and what it was going to mean for that of mankind. So we go back to John 19 and verse 30. Look in what he says. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up the spirit. So here Jesus in complete obedience to the Lord, he could say, it is finished. 
I have completed everything you gave me to do with perfection. I fulfilled all the scripture. I did what you told me to do. And because of that, mankind can be saved. But another thing we see here in John 19 and verse 30 is Christ surrendered. He had to surrender. When I mean surrender here, he had to surrender his life. We look again at John 19 and verse 30. Here it says at the end of that verse, and bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. Now, when Christ bowed his head, it wasn't that he bowed his head because he was dead. He willingly bowed his head and then he gave up his spirit. He did something here. Sometimes we don't notice that, but he bends his head over. He bows his head over and he gives up his spirit. He wills himself to die. Now, that is something that we cannot do. We cannot just die. We cannot say, well, today I think this very moment I'll die and we just die. That's not the way humans work. But yet Jesus, he had that power. He had the power in which he could say, okay, it is finished. And he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. He did that. The other, the two thieves that are on either side of him, oh, they died. But they died because of the uh, consequences of being on the cross. No telling what was done to them besides breaking of their legs. They died because of the cross. Yes, Jesus was on the cross, but he gave up his life while he was there. Again, that verse, he gave up his spirit. That's the way Jesus knew it was going to be all along. Nobody was going to take his life. He was going to willingly give of his life for mankind. Look what he says in John chapter 10 and verse 18. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This command I have received from my Father. You see, the death of Christ was something on his terms. There were times when certain individuals tried to kill him, and, and Christ would have to flee from their, from their uh, presence there. He knew it's not my time. When Christ died, it was going to be on his time, on his terms. And there in John 19, verse 30, we see that where he, he gave up his spirit. He willingly did. And if we'll look at that from that standpoint, that Christ willingly said, it's time for me to die, and he bows his head and he gives up his spirit, that may bring a whole different view that we have of the death of Christ. Because he willingly did this. He gave his life for us. So we see that in John 10 and verse 18. But we go back to John 19 and verse 30. Here we see a separation. Here it says, So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. A separation. His body and his spirit, his soul, separated. His body went to paradise. I mean, his soul went to paradise. We know that. That's what he told the, the thief that earlier that day. Today you will be with me in paradise. But his body stayed on the cross, at least for a, a short time longer, until it was taken down and placed in the tomb. Again, there was a separation there. And that separation is something that Jesus knew was going to happen, and it took place. And then three days later, his soul, his spirit, rejoined his body. And there he began to appear before disciples and other individuals to show that he was alive, very much alive. But we need to understand something as well today. Our bodies, well, they're decaying. Our bodies as well are, are every day a little weaker, a little weaker. That's just the way life is. That's the way things are working. But not so for our soul. Our soul is something that should be gaining strength every day. But too many times we're too much focused on our bodies, trying to get them to gain strength, and we neglect our soul. Look what Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and verse 16. Therefore, we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, that the inward man has been renewed day by day. So every day, our outward man, the old body, is perishing. But the inward man, our soul, it is being renewed. It becomes stronger and stronger every day. And that's good for us to know. Because we need to be focusing on our 
inward man, the soul, because that's the part of us that's going to live forever. Well, how do we grow that inward man? How do we grow our soul, strengthen it every day? Well, here's what Peter said in 1 Peter 1 and verse 23. Having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible, through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. It is through the word of God that we strengthen our soul, that our soul becomes stronger every day through the word itself. That's why when we read the scriptures, we're strengthening our soul. We want to do that. When we attend church services, we are strengthening our soul. And in times such as this, as we have studies here tonight and we learn of God's word, what we are doing, we are strengthening our soul because one day we know our soul is going to depart from our body. And hopefully, if we are Christians, our soul will be there in paradise awaiting the great judgment day. So again, Peter tells us, hey, we've been, you've been born again. Start strengthening your soul. Don't, as you know, the body's important, but don't lose focus on what is really important and begin to strengthen the soul. So back to John 19 and verse 30. Again, there the Lord said, it is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. It is finished. He bowed his head. He gave up the spirit. He was submissive to God. There was a separation of his body and his soul. Again, one day, you know, it's going to take place with us. That's why we've got to be prepared for this time. We know that flesh and blood cannot inherit uh, heaven. We're going to have a new body when that time comes, a body that Christ has right now. In 1 John 3 and verse 2, we're told there that we're going to have a body like him. Now, we're not told what that body's going to be like. It's just going to be like him. You see, after the resurrection, when Christ's body and soul reunited, for 40 days he was on the earth there teaching his disciples and prepared them for the time when he was going to leave. And then when he did ascend to heaven, at some point from the time he left earth until he went up into heaven, he got that different body, that spiritual body. Again, flesh and blood can't be in heaven, can't be there. And neither will ours. It will be, it will be our soul that will live for all eternity. We need to ask ourselves, am I preparing my soul for that great day? Or am I more involved in, in things of the body, things of the flesh? Don't overlook your soul. It is something that we don't need to take for granted because it's something we need to be working on and growing every day, as God's Word has said. It's just that important. Are you a Christian? Think about it. If you are a Christian, then you need to continue to build your soul and gain it. But if you're not, you need to become that child of God. And here we find when Christ said it is finished, he completed that great plan of salvation that God laid out. And now it's our part to follow and do what God says, what one does do to be saved. We are to believe in his son, John 3 and verse 16. We are to repent of our sins, Luke 13 and verse 3. Confess his great name, Romans 10, 9 and 10. And be baptized for the forgiveness of our sins, Acts 2 and verse 38. And there live a faithful life, Revelation 2 and verse 4. You need to ask yourself, am I prepared for that day? Why not get prepared? If, if we can help you in any way to become that Christian, or help you as a Christian need a prayer, you'll see our number here at the bottom of the page. Give us a call. We'll get back with you as soon as possible to help you to, to be a stronger Christian or to become a Christian either way. Again, we have this last saying, one of the last sayings that Christ gave on the cross. Very important because here he finished the great plan of salvation. So thankful for you being with us tonight. If you can be with us at the church building at 7 o'clock tonight, we'll be there and have an additional Bible study. Or if you can be with us Sunday morning, we'll be at the building at two different services, one at 9.30 and one at 10.45. We'd love to have you either one of those if you can. But if you can't, if you're shut in or sick, why not to be with us again at 10 o'clock Sunday morning for our online worship service there as well. Again, we thank you for being with us. In the program, you can see an update of our sick. Uh, remember, remember them in your prayers. They need your prayers and those who are caring for them. Uh, again, they would appreciate it, I know. Until next time, we're glad you're here. And may God bless until we meet again. And may we close with a word of prayer. We're thankful, Lord, for your words and how they 
Help us to grow stronger every day. And as we study these sayings of Christ, may we learn from them so that we too can grow and be prepared for when that day comes. Be with our sick and watch over them and help them in their time of need and those who are caring for them. And watch over us and be with us till the end. For it's in your son's name we do pray. Amen.